Thank you for listening to The Actors Room. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes and leave comments and reviews. The show is also on Facebook, Twitter, Google Music, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. The website for the show is theactorsroom.libson.com. The site gives you access to all past episodes. Enjoy the show. This is a quote by Robin Williams. Never pick a fight with an ugly person. They don't have anything to lose. I used to think that the worst thing in life was to end up alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to end up with people who make you feel alone. If heaven exists to know that there's laughter, that would be a great thing. And here are a few quotes that I have picked out that I'd like to read for you right now. This is from Billy Crystal in 2016. You know, he was my closest pal, and I loved him more than a brother sometimes, Crystal said. As genius as he was on stage, he was the greatest friend you could ever imagine. Supportive, protective, loving. This is also from Billy Crystal. He would keep a roll of $20 bills in his pocket, he said. When we would go out on the street, whoever needed it. Hey, Robin, how you doing? I'm a little down on my luck. $20? it was part of his day, was to help somebody out. And uh, welcome back to the uh, Actors Room, everybody. Um, This is going to be a special episode because I have my brother with me, and I wanted to mention that in my former episode. And uh, for some reason, I had a quote that Daniel Day had about Heath Ledger, and it kind of just blew me away, and I completely forgot about it. And when I sent out the episode, I was like, shit, I forgot to mention that my brother is going to be with me on this podcast. So go ahead and say something, Dave. Motherfucker. All right. See? And uh, most of the podcasts that we listen to, and this was kind of a cool thing because I wasn't that in the podcast, and I think you mentioned it to me. It's like, you got to check out podcasts. Yeah, there's a lot of good ones. There's a lot of good ones, and we're true crime fans. So we, I don't know, I'm addicted to about, what, four true crime Generation Y. Generation Y. That's my favorite, and there's true crime garage yeah that one's good and uh i think there's another one true crime all the time yeah i like yeah the only one only thing i don't like about them the true i think the last one you said what was that the uh true crime all the time yeah they spend about 20 minutes in the beginning of their episode sort of blowing each other Mm -hmm. and i say that because my god they read off like (laughs) all these names all these Patreon. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. actually skip all of that. Yeah. Well, no, like twenty. You, do you, you listen? To, oh, no, I don't listen to no, that either. I don't listen to it. It's just kind of. They'll have voicemails at the end. I'm not. I don't listen to that, that either. Like, yeah, I always shut it off. I'm like, okay, you know what? I just want the meat of it. So yeah, you know, I'm not into that with my show just yet because you know I don't have that many listeners. Um, and I've expressed in the past about kind of updating how like I look at my numbers, and it was really funny too because last week. I checked my numbers, and uh, on Monday, I had almost 100 downloads nice. on Monday. Nice. And I'll, I'll average maybe 20, 25 a day. Yeah. And if, how does that happen? Because the next day, I had 10. It's like, huh. yeah, I have a big following in Australia. Nice. I, yeah, <laughs> I don't know why, but I do. And I hope that expands and doing Heath Ledger, you know, because uh, well, he's Australian. Oh, yeah. You know. I, I, I have to admit, I haven't listened to that one yet. What, Heath Ledger? No. Yeah, it was, it was good. Uh, I was kind of proud of that one. Uh, there are a lot of connections between Heath Ledger, uh, Lawrence Olivier, and Daniel Day-Lewis. I think no there was connections between those three guys in like the, very, like the first 15 minutes of the episode. And uh, it just kind of came full circle with that episode. But we are going to talk about, um, which is going to be really weird and hard and, and fun and emotional. And I told my brother as before we started recording that I've been laughing and crying all week. Uh, he, my brother has done most of the research. I did a little on my own, but I kind of wanted to take his format, what he did, and we're just going to have a conversation, not only about Robin Williams and his life, but just about acting, too. If anything kind of comes up, we can kind of talk about it. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of acting. And a lot of acting, a lot of Robin Williams, because uh, I think that there are certain actors that we look up to because they, they make us feel something. 
I mean, isn't that what it's all about? We, we sit down, we watch a movie, and we walk away. And while we're watching it, we're going through all these emotions that Robin Williams gives to us. And we appreciate it. And not only that, but like, what other actor is, is good in range? Exactly. Can in, you think of anybody? In, in, when we've talked in the past, Years ago, you would have your list of top hundred actors. Oh, yeah. that you would fucking <laughs> yeah. go through and. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I stopped doing that, but I would yeah, do that well, like every year. <laughs> every year, yeah. I would do that. They, they'd shuffle around, but yeah, Robin do. Williams always came up as like one of the top because of his range. His versatility was. A, a pro- he was probably the first comedian to really break that boundary of comedy and drama. Yeah, because uh, there are comedians that have done films and done well, but yeah. I don't know if they've done well with drama. Not like he before has. Robin Williams. Uh, yeah, he really, Jim Carrey maybe. Yeah, but he still, and I love Jim Carrey, but he, his drama doesn't hold a match to what Robin Williams has no, done. No, no, it's not even close. No, I mean, um, Robin Williams, that range. It, you, you you talk about like Tom Hanks has that range. He's funny and dramatic, that and everybody be, loves him. But he's just got that. If I were to, con- I think if I were to compare any actor with Robin Williams, Tom Hanks might be an actor I would compare him to. Of course, because he started off doing comedy. Um, when you think about his early career, it was yeah, all comedy. Yeah. Uh, same with Michael Keaton. I think Michael Keaton did yeah. more comedy. Good point. And then started doing drama. Uh, getting more comfortable, and maybe executives, agents, producers, directors kind of saw maybe just that one performance. And I think that Robin Williams did, I, um, I think it was the Moscow movie that we were talking about. I didn't like it, but it showed his dramatic ability in that movie. And it was after that movie that he was taken seriously and given more drama roles. So, I mean... Uh, was that before Vietnam? Good morning, yes. Vietnam. Oh, yes, it was? It was. Uh, okay. Vietnam came a little after that, I believe. Because that's what really put him on the map as far as movies. Good Morning Vietnam? Yeah. I think that was the, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think <clears throat> if he was nominated for Vietnam. I, we should know that. I think that was, I, I'm, <laughs> You know what I mean? Was, he was Oscar nominated. He was nominated for, okay. Michael Douglas won for oh, Wall God. Street. Yeah. And, I mean, if we're going to dive into this now, we might as well do it. <laughs> dead, I mean, why not? Yeah. Dead Poets Society. Yeah. I think 1989. that was... That was the first time I, I was like, holy... I, not only do I love that movie, and I love Good Morning Vietnam. That, and we're going to touch upon this right now. I guess he ad-libbed. Yeah. Almost all of his lines, I'm talking in front of the microphone. When yeah. he's doing the DJ stuff. That was all him. I guess they said that he went 18 hours of just straight recording, improv, and then the director had to pick and choose what he was going to use in the movie. He just let him go. Yeah. He put the microphone in front of him, and the director said that he was just blown away about how he would change character, how he would, how he did in uh, Mrs. Doubtfire. He would be the... the, The Same deal there. Yes. All ad lib. And like, he would have a conversation back and forth between two characters. It was him. Yeah. How hard is that? I mean, think about that. It's ridiculous. Well, he was also... Uh, no one could match the energy that he had. And that's I mean, his mind went him. a billion miles a minute. Yes. Um, and, and I might get crucified for this, yeah. but like his stand-up was a little too... It's a little too much. Uh, it's it, not for everyone. It isn't. I and, don't think it is. And that's where there's a... There's some people who don't like him just because of that. Like, he, he was insane, you he know, was. even on talk shows. I mean, he, he was crazy with people who just couldn't keep up. And I'm glad you brought that up because during my research, I kind of delved into that a little bit. I read a little bit of a book written by a friend of his, and I think his friend was sort of in publicity, that sort of thing. They got close, and they would spend the rest of their lives um, – vacationing together and that sort of thing. So he got to know Robin Williams very well. And the thing that people would come up to him, this friend, about Robin was, is he really, like, on? He said, on, all the time. Yeah. The way he is on stage, in the movies, whatever, giving interviews. And he said, of course not. He's a human being just like everybody else. He needs his downtime. He would lock himself away for periods of time, 
and they would say, well, what does he do? He's like, he's, like, <laughs> he's huge into video games. Yeah. He yeah. loves video games. He actually uh, would take a friend of his to Electronic Arts from time to time, and he would actually go in there and test out games. Nice. Isn't that oh, that's awesome? Dude. I mean, because we're big video game fans. Yeah. Well, we, I used to be. Well, we, we grew up in the 80s. Yeah. So back when Nintendo was, you know, we had original. Atari coming up, was yeah. the biggest thing ever. I mean, we didn't have an Atari, but we got a computer that had all the games. Yeah. And then when Nintendo broke out, I mean, phew, my God, it took forever for my dad to buy the Nintendo system for us. <laughs> so we kept begging him and begging him. And uh, I was 13, I think, when he finally broke down, which yeah, is what? that sounds right. I was born in 76, so 86, I was 10, so 89. Yeah, that We got our right. first Nintendo system, and I became addicted to Super Mario Brothers. But, you know, that's another story. <laughs> um, but Robin Williams loved video games. And there's another time this guy said that he walked in on him playing a video game, a flight simulation game, where he was playing head-to-head in this game with Steven Spielberg. Now, Bill, Steven Spielberg was not in the room. It was more like a... Yeah, like a... Um, it was connected through Wi-Fi yeah. or Bluetooth, whatever the hell you want to call it. I don't know how they do no, it. No, I, I don't know either. Because I don't do that. Do you? No, no. It, it's a network connection on Xbox okay. or something well, like that. Anyways, he walked in on him playing the game, and I guess he got in his way, and Robin Williams just blew up at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's how passionate he was about his video games. Nice. So he wasn't always on. He would have his off time. You got to have that. And going back to my Daniel Day-Lewis episode, I think that's one of the things that when you're so into it and you place yourself 100 billion percent into something that you're really passionate about, it takes a lot out of you. It has to. And that's why they're so great. They need that break, those geniuses. I consider Robin Williams a genius. Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Stanley Kubrick was a genius. Robin Williams was a genius. There aren't that many. There are great actors, but I don't know if I consider them genius. Uh, well, Marlon Brando, I think, was a genius. Of course. With his behavior and you know, able to show that to us. Robin Williams was a genius. Not only was he smart, and we'll get to that, he went to Juilliard. That is not easy to do. I guess he was one of 20 yeah. people. Um, Hold on. Yeah, he's one of 20 students accepted into the freshman class and then one of two students to be accepted by the John Houseman into the advanced program at the school. John Houseman is one that older actor. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen The Paper Chase. No. You got to see that. John Houseman. He, was, he did commercials. He, he, did, he was the guy, the old guy that was like, we make, <clears throat> we make money the old-fashioned way. We earn it. That oh, old guy wow. with the white okay. hair. Yeah. That's John Houseman. Okay. Okay. He was a teacher at Juilliard. And Robin Williams, <clears throat> he said that he was a pretty cool guy. Although he may not look like he was a cool guy. <laughs> Something like a pretty s- s- stiff shirt, oh, so to speak. Right. But um, I guess he would have Robin Williams and Christopher Reeve in his class. And he would tell them to stand up. <clears throat> and I guess they would both stand up. And he would go, both of you have to change the world. Do it. Or wow. something like that. Yeah. And it was, I think Robin said that it was the very first time that a teacher really gave him the confidence to go ahead and, and really, hmm. you know, make it feel good and make it important. And John Houseman was a big part of that. And that was at Juilliard. And in Juilliard, I don't know, I don't think he was roommates with Christopher Reeve, but they became very close friends. No. Well, the right? other, yeah, the okay. other student okay. that, um, what does it say? Um... Because are you talking about the roommate? Yeah, there was only two freshmen. Okay. And Christopher Reeve was the other freshman. Whoa. Oh, to be accepted that year? Right. Oh, so, okay. And they became good friends <coughs> and, uh, you know, stayed best of friends for until Christopher Reeve passed away. They were kind of an odd pairing, too, when you think oh, about yeah, it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. He was tall and, like, yeah, extremely like good. Yeah, Superman, for Christ's sake. Extremely good-looking. Yeah. R- ridiculous. Robin Williams is... You know. you know, I'm not... Yeah, Robin Williams wasn't ugly, but more of a character actor look to him. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, a leading <laughs> yeah. man, you know. You know, he wasn't going to play Superman. You know, he's sure. not the Cary Grant character, <laughs> yeah. so to speak. And when he was at Juilliard, of course, learned a lot. Uh, and before I get into Christopher Reeve and his relationship, just to touch upon how hard it is to get into Juilliard. Oh, it really is. It's hard. one of the hardest um, artistic schools to get into in the world. They're very selective, 
and they only pick the very best and brightest people. Not only do you have to be talented, but you have to be extremely intelligent. Yeah. I think you have to have a certain IQ. Uh, you have to score something on certain tests. Rules us out right away. Yeah, uh, there's no <laughs> way we are getting into Juilliard. <laughs> hey, morons. <laughs> Unless we get like a really high recommendation from like the president yeah. of the United States, probably. That either. The highest of the high. There was no way we are going to get into there. Um, but I do also know that they have to audition as well. They just don't get in by word of mouth or recommendations or test scores. They have to get up there and do a piece of something. I'm sure he had to do a monologue, I'm sure. Probably. I don't know if yeah. Robin Williams played an instrument. In my research, I didn't. I don't think he played an uh, instrument. Or some actors, they have that musical thing yeah, going on. I don't know if he did. I don't think he did. He was more into comedy. Stand-up yeah. was something that he kind of dabbled in in the beginning of his career, but it was after Juilliard that he started, I think he moved to California, mm -hmm. okay, and then he dabbled with stand-up comedy. Yeah, well, I don't know about dabbled isn't the right word. I he mean, would he head, really, head on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he he started as a bartender okay. um, at a comedy place and uh, eventually made his way on stage. At the uh, comedy store is where he got he, his first real taste of, like, you know, yeah, his, big time. I have here his first performance took place at Holy City Zoo. It was a comedy club in San Francisco. Holy City Zoo? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Nice name. He, he was he was a bartender there and he made his way to the stage. Okay. But then yeah, like comedy store. Yeah. Right? That's where um, Louis Anderson was big at the comedy store. Yeah. I mean that a was a lot of that was it. Are. That was the place. Yeah. And I remember, I've heard Bob podcasts. Saget. Yeah, like even Bob Sa I'm sure it was a Bob Saget interview that he did. Um, I mean, the people, these comedians couldn't believe what they were seeing. I mean. Yeah. Not only like, the audience, yeah, but the comedians. I mean, yeah. the, the comedians were just like, what the fuck is going on? He was like, like a whirlwind. Yeah. A hurricane. They're tornado. just like, you couldn't follow him. Forget it. Yes. I mean, come on. And and the energy he brought was no one could possibly match it, what he was doing. And we might as well go here. I think that Mr. Williams was probably one of the greatest improv um, comedians, actors of all time. He was, he was witty and smart. Give him like, anything. Give, yeah, him, give him a pencil. The guy who can go an hour just oh, yeah. <laughs> with a pencil <laughs> in his hand. Could. Yeah. Yeah. He's he like, probably could. Do better. Try harder than a pencil. <laughs> 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 like yeah that's just he had that mind where it was so fast it, you know it, even the, some of the best comedians at that time just like they they couldn't they couldn't fathom what they were seeing i remember um, seeing a uh a stand-up routine he did in um i think he was in at berkeley in berkeley the city of berkeley california and he had a stand-up routine that he was doing and i think it was kind of a big deal it was a special uh-huh <clears throat> and he got up there, and like the very first thing he did was he just hopped off stage, and he started walking around the audience. I don't know if you ever saw that. Mm, I don't think so. It was so incredible. He went up to people. I think he went up to some lady, went right behind her, started playing with her hair, you know, talking about how you know it looked. And then yeah. he walked away from her, and in his own like his own voice, like he's pretending to be her. Oh, I worked on my hair for like two hours, <laughs> you yeah. know. Yeah. And then he grabbed some lady's uh, mink coat, and you know, put it on, and took the coat with him on stage, oh, wow. and went for at least ten minutes with that coat. And that's what made me think of just taking a pencil. Well, yeah. that's what he would do. He'd take a prop and just go. Oh, dude, everyone was probably fair game, and yeah. Yeah, that, can you imagine being in that audience? You're just like, oh God! What a blast! It's either, it's either please don't come near me, or I don't want to be next. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. And it also makes me think of, and I've mentioned before in the past, how much I really love the Actors Room interviews with James Lipton. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of James Lipton. He's a douche. Yeah, he's kind of a douchebag, but he's a very good interviewer. I'll give him that. Oh and, yeah. And my most favorite, I think, was Robin Williams and Mickey Rourke were my most favorite. Actor studio. I don't know why, but those two yeah. were just my favorites. And if do you remember seeing the Robin Williams one? I'm sure I've seen it. Okay, I'm not sure how much I remember of it. Oh though. my god, the way he cut. You know how they they have their intro, like they play all that music. Yeah. And they show Brando or you know James Dean yeah, and, and Meryl Pacino Streep or whatever, and, and Pacino and De Niro. De Niro, all those actor studio people, and then they show the name Robin Williams, our guest. Robin Williams. And then Lipton's sitting up there all dramatic, you know, with his stack of cards. <clears throat> and then Robin Williams comes out. And, he, you know, he makes an entrance. Uh, you think? Period. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
He went for at least 10 minutes improv. Oh, yeah. Of just course. B- acting like other people, being funny. And there was some lady in the front row. She was losing it. I mean, she yeah. was hackling, laughing. That, remember that? that? I remember <laughs> that. Like, it was obnoxious, though. Oh, like, yeah. Oh, it was like, like oh, okay, lady. That laugh Shut was up. just like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, she was having the time of her life. And, and I, I heard someone actually had to go to the hospital because they were laughing so hard. They hurt something inside. It, the actor studio yeah. thing? Yep. After that whole interview, someone, maybe it was that lady, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but someone was laughing so hard, they had to go to the oh emergency room. Oh, God. But yeah, he so pointed her job. out. He, he pointed her out, though, and he spent about five minutes on her just because of that laugh. So that's an example yeah. of his improv skills. Yeah. And I think that was something that he relied on and it worked for him because not only did it get him through doors, it got him to stay in the room, in the room of being a very successful artist. And his art lied primarily on his ability to improv and show himself to us. So uh, before we go any further, I want to touch a little bit about his childhood. And this is what I like to do in my podcast. I think it's important. I think it's something that it should be talked about because it shapes a person about who they are, where they came from, who their parents were. Uh, Did they have any brothers and sisters? Were they happy, sad? Were they lonely? Were they not? Were their parents dicks? Were they around? Well, that's the sort of thing that I like to talk about. So we're just going to touch lightly upon that right now. Uh, We're going to first talk about his dad. Uh, His dad was a very important person. All right. He was vice president of the Ford Motor Company. And uh, that's a big deal. He made a lot of money. His mom worked too. I'm not, I'm not quite sure what she did. Uh, I think she was, Uh, she did a few things. Yeah. But she was busy. Yeah. I Uh, I can't recall what she did. Right. But yeah, I, I think she kind of bounced around from job to job. Always busy. So Robin found himself being alone. Now, mind you, they were rich. They had a big house on the hill, like a mansion. So he would find himself with the nanny, okay? And now this is very similar to Daniel Day-Lewis, growing up rich and being raised pretty much by his nanny, okay? So Robin was born in Chicago and grew up in the posh Detroit suburb of Bloomfield Hills. His two half-brothers were already grown up when he was born. And Robin spent hours alone in the family, in their big house, okay? He was tape recording television routines of comics and sneaking up into the attic for practice. And he would practice imitations. Now, this is a quote from Robin. Quote, my imagination was my friend, my companion. End of quote. He had a lot of time to think. Williams credited his mother as being an important early influence in his sense of humor. He also said, that he tried to make her laugh to gain attention. And this is what we're going to talk about. Like I said, his parents, not around. But when they were around, he wanted to please his mother. And in doing so, he would get into his improv, get, show his skill. He was really good at imitating people. And this made her laugh. Very similar to Marlon Brando. When he was a kid, mom was a drunk, and his dad was a drunk as well. And he was always away on business. His dad, Marlon Sr., so whenever mom wasn't, you know, drunk, when she was sober, he would imitate farm animals that were on the land. And it kind of sparked her interest. And he could see a twinkle in her eye, and it made him feel good. And it sparked something. Like, hey, I'm good at this. I get a reaction. I'm getting love. I'm getting something from somebody else. And I think Robin Williams <clears throat> felt the same way about his mother, too. Uh, he described himself as a quiet and shy child who did not overcome his shyness until he became involved with his high school drama department. And I talked to Dave earlier before we started this podcast about that very thing. In school, he had to do an improv scene in front of the class, and he imitated people, and it opened him up. He got out of his shell because of this. In late 1963, when Williams was 12 years old, his father was transferred to Detroit. The family lived in a 40-room farmhouse, 40 rooms on 20 acres. Jesus, that's a lot of land in suburban Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, where he was a student at the private Detroit Country Day School. He excelled in school. He was very, very smart. If you don't know about this with Robin Williams, very smart, sharp as a tack. 
which also makes him a genius as well. Just his brains were just very advanced. Uh, he was also on the school's soccer team and wrestling team and was elected as class president. As his father traveled frequently for work and his mother also worked, like we mentioned before, Williams was attended by the family's maid or nanny and she was his constant companion. When Williams was 16, his father took early retirement and the family moved to California. Following their move, Williams attended Redwood High School in nearby Larkspur. At the time of his graduation in 1969, he was voted most likely not to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fucking good. morons. I love that. They're all like, yeah, they're checking themselves. <laughs> is it, uh, and he was also claimed the funniest by his classmates, but that is funny. Yeah. Least likely to succeed. Wow. Well, they were wrong about that one. I love that mm. shit. What are, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what are, I wonder what they're doing. Yeah. Not, not as good as Robin Williams did, I guarantee you that. Um, after high school graduation, Williams enrolled at Claremont Men's College in Claremont. Didn't stay there long, dropped out. Uh, he studied political science there, but sw- you know, I guess soon he realized that it just wasn't for him. And he wanted to pursue acting. So in that process, he attended uh, theater for three years at the College of Marin. It was a community college in uh, Kentfield, California. Uh, according to college, this college that he went to, the drama professor, his name was James Dunn. Okay. Uh, James Dunn called his wife after one late rehearsal to tell her that Williams was, quote unquote, going to be something special. Okay, so after his three years at uh, Marin, the college that he went to, he then went to Juilliard. And we already <clears throat> touched upon that, Juilliard, so we're not going to delve any more into that. So after Juilliard, he decided to move. And Juilliard is in New York City, by the way, if you didn't know that. He went from California to New York City to study at Juilliard. And then when Juilliard was over, he decided to move back to California to take on stand-up comedy. And we touched on that already. Did very well. Yeah. I mean, he got into the comedy store, which is not easy as well. Yeah. Blew everybody away. And he started auditioning for television. Yeah. Okay. And the story is, his first big role on television is Mork and Mindy. Yeah. And you want to go ahead and talk about the audition? Yeah, that he, did? he he went to audition for this you know character of Mork um, on Happy Days. And Weird, kind of strange, isn't it? Yeah. You want to talk about why they decided to uh, use a alien in Mork and Mindy? Do you know about that? No, I don't. Okay, Gary Marshall's son was a huge Star Wars fan. Okay, mm. and he said, "Dad, wouldn't okay. it be great if they have an alien on <clears throat> Happy Days?" And Gary Marshall's like, I don't know about that. That's a little out there. But he kind of wanted to humor his kid. He considered it and said, you know what? Why the hell not? Okay. Let's audition some people. So Robin auditioned. So Yeah, and <laughs> Gary Marshall's like, he told him to sit down. <laughs> and Williams immediately just sat on his head on the chair. <laughs> so like the first thing he did was... Yeah, I, I mean... And, Upside down on his head. He, you know. he pretty. I mean, Marshall pretty much hired him on the spot. I don't think right. he auditioned anybody else. That's right. That's right. He 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 found he found him. he found his work. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And uh, and immediately after that, he he got a his own sitcom work in Mindy. Right, from because just being a small character on Happy Days. Yeah, and before we move on to Mork and Mindy, let's talk a little bit about his alien in uh, Happy Days. Was it? with Henry Winkler. In this documentary I watched last night, Henry Winkler was on it a lot and talked about Robin Williams and working with him. I and love how Henry Winkler, hard- by the yeah, way. Oh, I do too. <laughs> Isn't Henry Winkler just he's fantastic? He's so fucking likable. And he's done a lot of uh, decent drama roles as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Uh, even though I don't consider, you know, Night Shift a drama. It's not. It's a comedy by Ron Howard. It and is, it's with Michael Keaton. But he dis- his seriousness yes. is funny. Like you right. feel so bad. He's such a loser. Oh god. And he play. I mean, he really does play a loser. He did so well in that role. And that's just fantastic. It, yeah. Anyways, that's so, a whole other episode. Is I, like shit. right. But Henry Winkler in this documentary was really talking about how hard it was to act with Williams on Happy Days because Henry Winkler as the Fonz. Had to keep a straight yeah, face. Yeah, it'd be okay? cool, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it'd be you, cool. You had Williams just being off the wall, <clears throat> doing all this crazy shit. And it was his job. His, that, 
He said that was his number one job. Gary Marshall told him, do you have one job? And that is to not laugh. <laughs> he said, do you know how hard that was not to laugh at this guy for awesome. as long as he was on the show? That was his hardest thing that he had to do. And because of the success of that character, because it was so different. I mean, you think about yeah. it. Oh, no, come on. It's so different. And what came next? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the public loved it so much. They're just like, wow, we have to give them a, a show. Like a spinoff. They would call a spinoff, yeah. right? And yeah. it was called Mork and Mindy. Yeah. And, and I, do you remember watching it when we were kids? I, well, oh, man. It I, would be on. I, now, I'm not talking about when it was actually on. Because we we had cable, uh, yeah. When no, we were it, kids. It, it ran from seventy eight to eighty two. Right. I was only two when it ended. <laughs> right. So I mean, I remember right. I remember the reruns because I know we watched that's, it a lot. That's what I meant. And I couldn't remember if it was like, was this really happening at this at live? But it wasn't. It was reruns. No, it but was we, reruns. We yeah. watched it a lot. Uh, we did. It was on pretty much every day. Yeah. In the I think in the late mornings it would be on. Mm -hmm. They would actually do it back then. What they would do is they would have Mork and Mindy on for an hour. Now, mind you. <clears throat> the episodes were half hour. They would have yeah. a back to back, back yep. you know, <clears throat> and just t touching upon Mork and Mindy too. If you remember the show and how it went, oh, do you remember how it ended? Yeah. Do you? He, mm -hmm. Yeah. He would uh, like call into the alien. Yeah. I, I forget his name, but he would summon him, you know, like he would say his <clears throat> name and it would blur out and yeah. he would be like in a black room. It would yeah. just be him. And he had the dip, that red and silver suit. Yes. And he'd be talking about like his experience that day, what he learned about the humans. That sort of, it was really interesting, kind yeah. of reflecting on the episode, mm -hmm. what he learned, and how humans are. It was actually kind of touching and eye opening. I love I love that he, about the show. He, he kind of touched upon his dramatic, his dramatic self. Like I mean, he was so zany, but right. then all of a sudden, at the end of that episode, he got serious. Exactly, and you got a taste of that. Yep. And it it was shocking. I know we're we're gonna delve now into the movies, but I mean his first big big movie I think is Good Morning Vietnam. That was until eighty seven. Yes, but we have to talk about his first movie. What was that? Do you remember? Think about it. It's a, 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 uh, Popeye. Yes. Yes, Popeye. No, okay. And he said is like if you watch it backwards, it has a plot. <laughs> <laughs> And now, as a kid, I remember watching it a lot, and I enjoyed it. Oh, you know? I did too. But man. if I watched it now, I'd be like, "What yeah, is this?" I know. For um, kids, I think it was fine. Yeah, as a kid, I liked it because I loved that, Popeye. But isn't that what it was for, kids? Yeah, it was. You know, exactly. If it was adults, were like, "What the fuck is this?" Oh, I loved Popeye the cartoon when I was a kid. Yeah, it was oh, great. I watched it all the, every day. For, but that was the first thing I watched in the morning. Was Popeye? Like, Dad would make me a. Uh, uh, back breakfast in the morning, my cinnamon toast or whatever the hell you'd make yeah, me. Uh, French toast. French toast, whatever. And I would sit down and watch that show. And I thought he did fine. The, his rendition of Popeye was oh, yeah. really good. Yeah, it's the movie itself. I mean... It's not... I didn't think it was horrible. <laughs> I'd have to see it know. again recently. It's I, been I so long since I thought I've the casting it. was really good. Shelly yeah, Duvall yeah, played she, Olive Oil. Yeah, she, she was, looks just like Olive she Oil. Was perfect. <laughs> she was good. And Brutus was it? It wasn't Brutus, the yeah, bad guy, big I don't guy. Know who the actor was yeah. though. But I don't either. I th I don't, I don't think know. He did much. I don't know if he did much, but I thought he was perfect. The movie bombed, and Williams was sort of heartbroken that his first movie just in it just wasn't good. It didn't do well at the box office. So didn't he go back to, I think he went back to stand-up for a little bit. He had to regroup, he said. Okay. The movie experience was bad, and he thought, I got to keep working. So he went back to stand-up for a bit, and I think that's what led into Good Morning <clears throat> Vietnam. Yeah, we're going to talk about Good Morning Vietnam in 1978, his first major break. And it's because you get, he gets to showcase. I think you said 1978. That's Did I? 87. Okay, I said, okay, we're not going to stop it. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes when I make mistakes, I'll stop it. I'll go back and race it. But I said 78, I meant 87. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 We're time jumping here. All right, so 87, Good Morning Vietnam. And uh, he got to showcase his improv in this movie, like I mentioned before. Yeah. You want to touch on some of the Good Morning Vietnam? Well, it's been a while since I've seen it. Um, but yeah, it, it, like you said, most of it was improv, and right. um, you know, he, so he had that com that comedy he was able to um, put in showcase. Yeah. But then it was also drama too. Uh, 
he had that great scene with um, Emmett, Emmett Walsh. Emmett Walsh is it? I think it's Emmett Walsh. Um, he passed. You know how five years he, ago. he confronts him about. Um, Emma Walsh confronts him about not airing that, you know, he's like, you're not going to talk about this, this episode, this, there's right. something that happened in Vietnam and he's yes. like, it didn't happen. Oh yeah. Cause he was going to give like a news. Yeah. Yeah. And he was going to talk about it and he's like, you're not, right. you know, and that's a great scene. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, he, he, he got to display that too. Um, which I don't know how much more you want to talk about that, but I mean, that kind of delves into how he's, you know, then Dead Poets Society yeah, but before comes we, after that. Yeah, before we get to Dead Poets, I also want to mention a scene in Good Morning Vietnam that's my favorite part in the movie, is when he's really kind of down on himself. What am I doing here? Does it matter that I'm here? Who fucking cares? And he's on that Jeep with uh, Forrest Whitaker. Okay, and Forrest Whitaker's trying to talk him up like, it, what you're doing is important. It means something to these guys. All the soldiers, they tune into you every day. They're going through shit. They want to laugh. They want that something that makes them feel like they're, you know, at home or yeah. reminds them of home. Mm-hmm. And they're in the Jeep, and there's, a, there's, like, buses of soldiers that are, like, just sitting there waiting. You know, they're backed up, whatever. And they notice Robin Williams' character. And I forget his name in the movie. Um, what is his name in the movie? I forget. Uh, I don't know. I know. That's stupid that I don't remember his name in the movie. But anyways. Adrian. Adrian. Okay. They go, oh my God, aren't you Adrian? He's like, oh, yeah, right, right. He's like, good morning, Vietnam. Just say it one time. He's like, no, I'm not saying it. And he's like, all right, good morning, Vietnam. And hey, they start cheering. And then, you know, he starts to get a smile back on his face. And then he's like, okay, you know, what's your name? And he goes, uh, you know, something, he says his name, and he goes, where are you from? You know, and they start going back and forth with dialogue, and he gets yeah. them laughing, and then the buses start to move away. And as they're moving away, you know, they're smiling and waving at him, and he's waving back, and he's got a big smile on his face, and it's a cute little yeah. scene. Yeah. How when they, the buses are leaving, and you see these soldiers, and you know they're just going through what they're going through, and just to hell. see him, yeah, hell. <laughs> hell. And... You know, soldiers need that something to lift their spirits. And you felt that in that movie. That might be the most important thing about that movie. Yeah. Is that the soldiers, they turned on their radio and they heard a familiar voice that made them laugh. It made them forget about what they were going through. So then we're going to talk about Dead Poet Society. 1989, he played John Keating. Dave, you want to talk about this one a little bit before I... Give my little input on it because uh, you said it's been a while since you've seen it. Yeah, but um, I see it like once a year. Do you oh, really? Oh God, it's one of my favorite movies. Yeah, well, yeah. it's yeah. it's great. And it's always on Netflix and shit too. It, it is. is it? Yeah, it's like a a staple. It always seems to be on, <clears throat> and if they take it off for a little bit, it comes like right back on. Like a month later, <laughs> they must it's get, hilarious. They yeah. get complaints. They might get complaints or something, but I mean, that character. Yeah, he, it's such a likable character, and he, he really gets the... He, it's the first time you really see him, I think. I, I believe it's the first time you see him in a movie where he, he's not Mork. He's not He's not a, that stand-up comedian who seems to be on cocaine and all over the place. Right. He's, he's a teacher that, man, you wish you had. I was just thinking that. You know? That and, teacher you wish you had. And uh, he, he actually did reference, like, he... I think he had someone in mind... Um, one of his teachers growing. Oh, okay. No, actually, he said I, I wanted it to be a teacher that I never had. Oh, I think that's what he said. A teacher that actually cares, entertains yeah. the kids, mixes yeah. it into his teaching. Right. Uh, where he would have the kids get up, actually move around. Uh, they would go outside, kick a ball while they're singing. He taught poetry. That's important. We didn't mention that. In the school, it was a private school. Was it like a was it a military it, school or was it more like boys a boys school? I know it was more like a, a private school, like yeah. a really high yeah. end private school. These all these kids were rich, you know, well bred. Yeah, and, and to have he, a teacher like that was yeah. just unheard of. To, right to 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 break the mold of of the teaching. Yeah, uh, and <clears throat> I mean, there's so many good scenes in it, but of course, the my captain, my captain mm. is at the end. At the end. Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're just like, man. Every time I see it. You, you know, he's packing up his stuff and he's ready to go. And they have that teacher who's like the, the substitute teacher who's filling yeah. in, you know, and he's got to come in and get his stuff. Obviously, if you've seen the movie, right. we don't need to tell you. Um, 
but yeah, I, I I don't know what you wanted to touch on with that, but uh, uh, you know. one thing I do want to touch upon is the acting performances of some of the kids in that movie. Just amazing. Uh, you got Robert Sean Leonard was yeah. the main kid yeah. in, in the movie, and a young Ethan Hawke. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was his next big movie after he did Explorers. I don't think no, not too many people know of Explorers. Uh, he acted alongside River Phoenix in that movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was his first big movie. And then after that, he decided to go to high school. So he didn't act for a while. And he still auditioned from time to time, I heard. But it wasn't until after he graduated from high school that he started to get back into acting again. And this was his big first role. And Ethan Hawke took off after this movie. And you'd see why. Very, he had yeah. a couple of very emotional scenes in the movie. Oh, yeah. And Robert Sean Leonard is also very good in it. Definitely. And I forget some of those other actors. But there was that Ro- Ro- Rolanda. Uh, was one of the 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 kid uh one of the uh one of the kids in the class and you, you 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 do movies about like high school or kids you always have to have that oddball renegade student that always is just over the top well that was this guy and when they would go to the uh they would sneak out at night the dead poet society that's what that was the kids there would be a small group of kids and they would sneak out in the middle of the night and go into caves and read poetry to each other. Us, I know. That sounds pretty gay. But you know what? <laughs> well, it's a timepiece, too. At it's the a time. time it was at like the cert- 50s. Yeah, I, I want to say something like I that. I think it was the 50s. It took place in the 50s. But you know, not only would they go out and read poetry, but they would bring, you know, they, cigarettes they, like, and cigars. Even they would bring girls point, in there. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you know, I know today people are like, what? So? <laughs> <laughs> poetry. Yeah, poetry, but, you know, they would make a, di- a night out of it, not a day, but they would make a night out of it. It was getting away. And I think that that movie really gave me hope that Robin Williams was on his way of being something very special. And in that movie, Dead Poet Society, Robin Williams was nominated for Best Actor in a Leading Role and lost to, guess who? Daniel Day-Lewis in my left foot. So yeah. that would have been a tough one. To- <laughs> <laughs> Big surprise. You're up against Daniel Day-Lewis. Daniel Day-Lewis, who did like, what, 30 films and is nominated yeah. half of them. He's nominated again this year, I think. Of course he is. Of course he is. He does a movie. Did you know that he retired? Yeah, I didn't know that until I listened to your last Let's podcast. See, you didn't know that either. I didn't know that either. He'll be back. Well, I, I put money down that he'd be back. I hope so. Do you? Um, He's going to miss it. I don't, I don't know, man. He's weird. I mean, well, not weird. I mean, with different. acting, different. Def- definitely different. I yes. mean, he's very picky with what he does. And, man, <sighs> if he feels like I'm done, he, he might be. Man. It's a shame. Um, it is. But, uh, you know, he's getting older now. He may be mm. like, maybe I'm retired. That's I mean, amazing. He, people retire from jobs, right? He may see it as yeah, just a if, job. He's like, yeah. I made my money. I did what I wanted to do. But still, I, I was... Shocked, but not completely surprised because of the fact that he would take off a, a long period of time between films. Yeah. The longest was five years. That's a long time for an actor. Yeah, I mean... It is. It's it's very uncommon. Very. Uncommon. <laughs> you know, I mean... Just really, like you said, weird. That would be weird. The fact that he takes off that long. So, obviously, it takes a lot out of him, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The prep. I don't know if it's the preparation that takes forever or the unwinding that takes forever. Maybe it's a little bit of both. There's a, like maybe two years to unwind. <laughs> yeah, maybe. A year to prepare. <laughs> but what a freak. He's a yeah. fucking freak. Yeah. Okay. It, it, anyways. <laughs> anyway, we're going to move on from Daniel um, Day and, and talk about what next? Oh, Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Awakenings. Oh. 1990. He played Dr. Malcolm Sawyer. Sawyer or Sire? Sayer. Uh, Sayer. Um, I fucking love this movie. Mm. Uh. Robert De Niro. Yeah. Go in ahead, my say opinion, it. Go ahead. I, I think this is his best performance. And you can't, I can't disagree. It, it, it's a side of right? De Niro. It's a role of De Niro's that's not very common, which I right. like. You right. know, I mean, he's good as the tough guy. We've, yeah. we've seen it a hundred times or how many times he played it. Right. Um, but in this role uh, as uh, shit, the hell yeah. is his name in that? Oh. Um, uh, Robert De Niro's character in Awakenings? Leonard. Leonard. Um, I mean, he, it's a side of him you, you just never seen before. And no. I think it's, it flexes his muscles as an actor more than anything else he's ever done, which 
probably a lot of people wouldn't agree with. You got Goodfellas and you got Good, right. you know, Godfather Good. Part Two. Yeah, Gra- I mean, Godfather Part Two might be second because he's not the tough. Well, he plays a mafia yeah, yeah, gangster, but he, he, but he, he doesn't play it that way. It. He plays, yeah, right. He plays a young Marlon Brando character, and he plays it very soft, very lighthearted, very reserved. And I think that was a nice choice because mm-hmm. Brando's character is sort of like that too. He played it very reserved. Yeah. And I think he he took that and and continued or pre-continued because he plays a young Vito Corleone and did a very good job. He he won best supporting actor for that role. Yeah. As uh, he should have. Yeah, and what's really strange too is that not one line of English dialogue. It was all Sicilian dialect through his whole role. Yeah. Which I think he was the first American actor to win an Oscar, not speaking one line of English dialogue, which is really strange. But his acting was so good in it, and in this one, just the same. This Leonard character, he I don't know if, if you don't know about this movie, would he had some sort of it was um, uh, disease, like a weird <clears throat> they, he became rare, like catatonic, yeah, and you know he was like in this sleep and like a coma, and no and way. Robin Williams was the doctor to fix him. To fix this condition, mm-hmm. um, based on a true story, mm-hmm. and uh, he eventually finds some sort of medicine. It's like a serum that he it, that, mixed with orange juice or something. Yeah, and, and, and he he comes out of his coma, this catatonic yeah. state, and it, it, it's 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 almost hard to describe because De Niro is so great and. And, and coming out of this, he almost is like a little boy when he wakes up. Because he was a little boy when he got this yeah. disease. And so. then <clears throat> eventually, not to, not to ruin the movie, but, you know, he, he gets sick again. And, and yeah. you know, Williams as a doctor, is he cares so much and he's trying. It, it's, I don't know. You just need to see it. Yeah, I you think really that's probably the best way to describe it because I think you see a uh, a side of not only De Niro doing something different, but Robin Williams as well. His character is very fidgety. I know Robin Williams is fidgety, but in a different way, like in a more controlled way. Controlled. His character is kind of really shy, like mm-hmm. really like, uh, like almost very soft spoken. Yeah, you know, I, it was d- d- it was different on a lot of levels. A dark movie, I felt. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it was very kind of dark. Subject, of mm-hmm. course. Not too many laughs. <laughs> Yeah. You know, no, it, it was straight up, <laughs> straight up drama. Yeah. Uh, and very well done. Very surprised. Neither of them was nominated. I know that Robin wasn't. Yeah. And I have a question mark there. Not nominated. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think they, he was. And I don't think De Niro was either. It says De Niro best. Yeah. That was my opinion. Oh, his best, best performance. performance. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, uh, if you've never seen Awakenings, it's one of those movies that might have been, you know, slipping through the cracks, so to speak, for De Niro fans and Robin Williams fans. But so if you've never seen it, both of us recommend it very highly. And his next film in 1991 is one of my personal favorites of Robin Williams. And he acts alongside one of my most favorite actors and very underrated actor, I think, Jeff Bridges. Yeah. Those well, two working together, oh my God, I haven't seen chemistry like that in two actors. I, I just, I don't think I've, I've ever seen the chemistry those two displayed was so fucking amazing. I, they, it was like they've been acting with each other for their entire lives, yeah. these two guys. Yeah. And they were completely different characters, Yeah. weren't they? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean... Uh, touching upon Robin, Robin <clears throat> Williams' character, you want to talk about his the way, maybe kind of do a little history or explaining what his character was all about. <sighs> Man, like how did he's freaking he, crazy? Yeah, he. He's, how did he become crazy? He's homeless. Remember? He's homeless. His character's homeless and clearly insane. Right. Um, Why did he become insane? Because of a tragedy. Yep. His wife was shot in front of him in a restaurant or something. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it, it's, his relationship with Jeff Bridges is tied together near the, well, the beginning of the film. Well, that's how it starts off. I think, doesn't it? Like mm, he's Jeff Bridges, his character is like this big DJ. Yeah. Correct. He's like a Howard Stern type of character. Exactly. Very right. He's got his own show. He's really, really popular. Um, but, uh, 
it, it turns if you haven't seen this movie, this is a spoiler. Go ahead. That Jeff Bridges was on uh, a call with some crazy guy who said he's going to kill uh, his. It was it his ex. I think it was something about his, his ex-wife. And, yes. And Jeff Bridges, just being a DJ, just being a performer in a sense, was just like, well, then just go fucking do it, you know. Right. And he does. Stop your bitching. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. And, and he, he kills does. this woman. And that woman happened to be Robin Williams' wife. Yes. And, you know, Jeff Bridges finds this out later on in right. in, in this movie. Um, so he feels completely responsible for the state that he's in. And it's just a hell of a story. He's trying to get him romantically involved with this woman. And Robin Williams slowly, you know, comes out of this crazy state but then falls back into it. I think he's crazy the whole time, but Jeff Bridges' character tries to get him, like you said, involved with this woman because Robin Williams really loves this woman. He's been following her around. Stalking her. Stalking her, so to speak. And he ends up with the... I think he does end up with her for a very short period of time. I don't know if they end up together at the end, but they start getting along. It's hard for Williams to kind of have a relationship yes and because he does miss his wife and that's why he went crazy it's because he missed his wife so much he went insane yeah and uh his acting is all over the place in this one too because remember that scene where they're in central park remember that where he gets naked he he rips (laughs) off his yeah he rips off his clothes and you see robin williams ass yeah yeah oh yeah he's (laughs) he's a hairy man (laughs) he's fuck naked Running around, he's and like, he lays down, doesn't he? Yeah. He lays, well, then he's rubbing his ass on the grass, and <laughs> and he asks Jeff Bridges, he's like, you know why dogs do this? He's like, because they can. Because they can. <laughs> <laughs> and it feels good. <laughs> they must know something we don't. I found it out. <laughs> and like I said to both of them, Jeff Bridges is such a great actor. He plays the straight man, does it well, and you see comedy between the two of them. They, It's a drama piece. But there's comedy in it. Oh, yeah. They play it's, off of each it's other. It's funny as hell. Jeff Bridges plays a straight man, and Robin Williams is all over the place. They're reacting off of each other. Beautifully done. And my favorite part in the movie is when I think Robin Williams is battling this, this these knights. There's a red yeah, knight that he sees. Knight. Yep. It's imaginary, of course. Look out. But he, <laughs> see, he sees this red knight from time to time because he, he thinks that his goal or his purpose on Earth is to get the Holy Grail. In that castle thing yeah. in New York City. It yeah. looks like a it, castle. Yeah. And he believes that the Holy Grail is in this castle. And they have to go in there and get this grail. It's hilarious. And the darkness <laughs> night that he sees. And I think that at one point in the movie, Jeff Bridges is trying to help him out, give him some money. Here, I'm going to give you some money. Take it. You know, and Robin Williams doesn't want it. Money doesn't yeah. mean anything to him. Yeah, he, he right? ends up finding out, you know, he turns, you know, Jeff Bridges gives him the money, he turns around and walks, and then he turns and looks at Robin Williams, and he's giving it to some other guy. He's like, I gave that to you, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like, that's not for him. He's like. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it was shortly after that, that he sees the knight in the distance, and he starts chasing after it. Yeah. And Jeff Bridges is he's chasing too. Him. Yeah. And then he finally finds him, and he's in Central Park sitting on a rock. Yeah. Like, just all calm. <laughs> yeah. He's just sitting there, and, and Jeff Bridges is all windy. He's like, what the hell are we chasing? He's like, oh, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, what the fuck? <laughs> this guy is so fucking insane. <laughs> oh, God. So great. Okay, here we go. Okay. Oscar. Moving on. Nominated. No. Oh, yeah. Best actor in a leading role, and he lost to Anthony Hopkins. When he did Silence of the Lambs, yeah, so you can that's, understand that. That's tough. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree with that. Yeah. But he was also, uh, he won the Golden Globe. Oh, really? Yeah. For best, I didn't know that. Best actor in a motion picture, comedy or musical. Okay. So, still, that's, uh, that's good. It's a separate category from what they have for the Oscars. That makes sense, though. You know, that nomination and mm-hmm. winning that, that makes sense. Uh, he was the first choice for the role of Bob Wiley. And what about Bob? What? <laughs> but was forced to turn it down because he was finishing filming of The Fisher King. Wow. I, I don't know, man. Bill Murray was pretty yeah. fucking good. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I was okay. I'm okay with that. I yeah. am. It's, it's always interesting. To hear about that? And I, I have a lot of, I maybe not a lot, but I have, a, I have some where the roles that he got yeah. were 
offer to other people. Okay. It's always fun to know what that movie would have been like. Oh, I know. I think about that with stuff a different all the time. actor. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I kind of like delving into that. When you go into IMDb, you kind of learn about some of that stuff, about all the other actors they auditioned, or or they had to turn it down because they were doing another project. That happens a lot, I oh, think. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. And I think <clears throat> I think something I want to get into now, before I forget, go is ahead. that he was up to play the Joker in the yeah. first Batman. Yeah. Okay? And... It was offered to Robin Williams first. Yeah. I th- no, no, it no. was offered to Jack first. It was offered to Jack first. And as he was on the fence. Yeah. And I think turned it down. <clears throat> so they went to Williams. Williams yeah. said yes and was slated to take on the Joker. Jack Nicholson found out about it mm-hmm. and found out that Robin Williams was going to play it. And he said, okay, I'll do it. Robin Williams was pissed. Yeah. So pissed <clears throat> that he had, he didn't do any film. I don't know what. What uh, he, company did it that? It was um, yeah, what, Warner what, Brothers. Warner Brothers. Yeah, he boycotted Warner he, Brothers for he a was, while. He didn't do a movie with them until they apologized. Well, you better apologize, and they, as they should. That's fucking dickish. That is that's, dickish, you know, man. I mean, Nicholson turned all, it down, right? We all understand Hollywood is a fucking dickish place. Yeah, this is not new. No surprise to anybody out there. That you know, notion. but I mean, that's kind of a little inside scoop of like. Robin Williams could have played the Joker. And would have done really um, good. <laughs> had Jack Nicholson not been like, wait, whoa, whoa, wait. Yeah. I want to do it. Yeah. Um, anyways. Anyways, let's move on to Hook. Hook, yeah. Hook, 1991, the same year. Same that was a year. busy year. Yeah. Okay, uh, Robin Williams became best friends with uh, director Steven Spielberg after making this film. Reportedly, after Williams' death, Spielberg decided to watch this film out of remembrance, but couldn't finish it. Because he couldn't stop crying. Isn't that yeah, something? that's so sad. That's how much he touched people, and we're going to talk yeah, about we'll, that a little we'll, later we'll on. We'll definitely get into that. Um, there were frequent good-natured battle of wits, so to speak, exchanges between Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. Oh, go figure. <laughs> In one incident, Hoffman was not happy with his performance and asked for a scene to be reshot. Williams quipped, Try acting. A reference. <laughs> <laughs> a reference. To the Hoffman slash Lawrence Olivier exchange on the set of Marathon Man. That's a very famous story about Hoffman being into his method acting, not sleeping, so he looked yeah. like shit the next day. And Lawrence Olivier, after a good night's sleep, saw Robin, you know, I'm sorry, Dustin Hoffman looking like shit and said, Hey, kid, why did you just try acting? Yeah. It's so much easier. And you get some sleep. But Daniel Day Lewis explains later that it doesn't matter where you get from A to B. Oh, okay, no. where you yeah. start and where you finish, it doesn't matter Dude, how you get there. Gary Kingston from the Our teacher, Playhouse, yes. he'd say there's a thousand ways to skin a cat. You but got at the that end, right. they all bleed. <laughs> it's like, great. at the end of this year, you will bleed. Oh, God, we bled in many ways in yeah, those classes. <laughs> <laughs> Emotionally, and sometimes I, physically. And I did physically bleed yeah. during a scene. Uh, some girl I was... <laughs> In, in a scene with she had a ring on and she was flaying her arms around and it swung up and hit me in the cheek and I was bleeding and I know I got hit but I, I just kept going and after the scene it was blood all over my face and I was just like oh I, this you know it's okay the scene went well so I mean a good example of of uh, actors doing what they had to do to get to uh, a performance that they were proud of I don't know if any actor is really happy with the end product because artists just simply yeah. will never be completely happy yeah. with the end result. I mean, you're an artist. You draw all the time. How often is it that you step back and go, oh, my God, fucking amazing? Yeah, not often. I will never do a- another one like that again, yeah. maybe. Or, you know what? It, does, it just right. doesn't happen. You're, own, you're your own worst critic. That's all there is to it. Yeah. That's why a lot of actors, they don't even watch their movie. They, I, yeah. And I get that. I'd be like, I wouldn't want to watch it either. Because it's so weird. Yeah. Seeing yourself up on y- screen. You're very, you know. Critical. And plus, there's different takes, and they're like, I didn't like that take. What the fuck? Right. You know? Like, they could they, do it why forever. They should, why'd they choose that one? Right. So, I mean, talking about Hook a little bit, I mean, it's a silly movie. It's a well, kid uh, movie. It's a, I mean, kids it's a love great it. movie. Oh, my kids love it. They love Absolutely. that movie. Um... I mean, acting wise, I mean, it's still it's solid acting by everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's not your actor's type of movie, but still, it's it's come on, it's Hook. It's Hook. Who, I you know who who I, doesn't love Hook. You know who I really liked in that movie, Bob Hoskins. 
Oh yeah, I thought yeah. he was. I think that he was probably the best actor in that movie. I yeah. don't know well, why. Well, I don't know. I, I I just really liked his performance. I think he's kind of underrated too, Bob Hoskins. Uh, uh, but um, like I said, a fun movie. Uh, Robin Williams, Dustin Hoffman, and I think we all know Julia Roberts. Ju- Julia Roberts and her cute little legs as Tinkerbell. <laughs> How cute. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying I'm, I'm not a fan of Julia Roberts. I think she's a fine oh, actress. Yeah, she's I really, really good, do. Man. I, I do. She is. And, uh, you know, she's it's really weird, great. too, when uh, I think of Julia Roberts, I think of, I, I don't know why, I always think of her brother, Eric. Really? I, because he started acting first, of course, because he's older. Yeah. And, you know, he had a career. Not a great career. And mm-hmm. he still pops up from time to time. <clears throat> yeah. He I think does. he was in. Uh, some of the Batman movies, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but he never reached the pinnacle that his sister did. No. I always kind of wonder if that, if he's sort of jealous of her. Probably. I, I don't know. I, I would be. Because <clears throat> he's had a pretty steady career. I think he's had problems. Yeah, maybe. Um, I'm not, I don't know that much about him. Yeah, I think he was on that celebrity rehab, uh, uh, you know, that okay. show. I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. he was on that. At, uh, d- d- Whatever they all need to be in that. The Pope, the Pope of <laughs> the, Greenwich yeah, Village. That's a fucking good. Mickey movie. Rourke. Yeah, it actually is. It almost um, seems like an independent film. It yeah. has that feel to it. Oh, it was. Yeah. Okay. So moving on from Hook, we're gonna touch on Aladdin, which he played genie. Wow. Right. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I haven't seen this since probably 1992. <laughs> Yeah, no, me too. I mean, I'm just not uh, big with... My kids have seen it, but I really don't tune in. I, yeah. It's a, it's a cartoon. It's a kids movie, yeah. cartoon, and, you know... People I'm love not, it. I'm not really into Disney movies. Uh, I, I yeah. mean, I gotta be honest, I haven't seen many. This is probably one of the few that I have seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've seen Lion King. That, yeah. That might, you know, uh, Bambi back in the day. But I think we agree on that. I'm not big into the yeah. cartoonish movies. But he but, uh, was yeah. all over the place with Genie. Yeah. Oh, I'm it, sure a lot improv. It was, yeah, and, and I think it's 16 hours of material that mm. was improv. Mm. It was, I think, he shot for three days wow. or so, and everything he said was improv, and I don't, I don't, yeah, his, <laughs> because he ad libbed so many lines, the movie script was turned down for best adapted screenplay at the Academy ah! <laughs> Because he did so much yeah, ad libbing, it was so much ad libbing wow. that they couldn't possibly nominate it. Incredible! So they're probably the screenwriters are like, "Well, fuck you, dude." That, that went out the window. <laughs> Whatever I wrote down, and I sat for months yeah. writing that script. Oh well, we worked really hard on that. <laughs> that Robin Williams fucker. Damn him. Okay, we'll move on from Aladdin, <laughs> and uh, we're gonna touch on uh, his probably his most popular film. Yeah, I would have to say, yeah. right? I think when people think of Robin Williams. They think of Mrs. Doubtfire in 1993, where he plays Daniel Hillard slash Mrs. Doubtfire. Um, the character Mrs. Doubtfire was first performed by Robin Williams at a show Andy Kaufman did at Carnegie Hall. That I didn't know. And Williams pretended to be Kaufman's grandmother. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I actually, um, it, it, if I'm not mistaken, I have this Andy Kaufman Car- Carnegie Hall performance on VHS. Okay. And it's basically Robin Williams sitting in this, like, lazy boy type chair Uh the whole time on stage, like, kind of, like, in the corner, just sat there as an old woman. Wow. And once in a while would kind of, like, wave or something (laughs) like that. I mean, it was weird. Wow. But that was Andy Kaufman for you, (laughs) you know? Weird. Yeah. Yeah, he was a weird guy. Wow. So that's what spawned this Uh, character then. So I mean, he looked a lot like Mrs. Doubtfire, if you ever see it. Okay, so he took that character he did for Andy Kaufman, which is interesting. Yeah, well, sort of, I mean, he, he didn't speak, I don't think. He, he just looked like Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, okay. So he didn't he, really yeah, say anything. I don't okay. think he said anything during the show. Okay. He just sat there on stage as okay. an old woman, being his grandmother, apparently. And before we move any further, I kind of want to touch on Robin Williams being connected with a lot of other actors slash comedians in the entertainment business. And I want to talk about the fact that he was one of the people that was around John Belushi the night that he died. Yeah. Robin Williams was in his room alongside with, guess who? De Niro. Robert De Niro. Yeah. Uh, They were with him that night. Yeah. And I'm sure that affected him very much. It did. And it woke him up, he says. Yeah. He said uh, he got clean shortly after that. 
and and also he had a, a kid. I think his first kid around that time, and that also opened up his eyes. He, he couldn't be. Yeah. He's like, you can't be around a baby high as a kite on coke. You know, <laughs> you know, it yeah. just you can't do it. So he kind of woke up to that fact, and he really battled with. And I, you want to talk about this now, with the, his drug addiction. Or you want to wait till later. We want to no, wrap up the movies first, and then kind of go into that, um, because I, it's a big part of his life. Yeah, we, we maybe we just stay on track with the movies. Sounds good. So we're talking about Mrs. Mrs. Doubtfire. Doubtfire. Okay. Woo. All right. Robin Williams decided to test out the believability of his Mrs. Doubtfire character during filming by going as Mrs. Doubtfire into an adult bookstore. I love this story. That's great. Okay, he was making a purchase as this old lady. <laughs> okay, buying Hello, porn. Dear. <laughs> Hello, dear. Do you have anything with big penises? <laughs> but anyways, he did it, and he pulled it off. Like, nobody noticed, right? And uh, his own son did not recognize him in his Mrs. Doubtfire outfit. Yeah. So that's saying something about yeah. how convincingly he was as Mrs. Doubtfire. I mean, that whole outfit <clears throat> is just amazing. Yeah. It looks nothing like him at yeah. all. And that accent, although it does sound like Robin Williams because it is him. You it's know? convincing enough, though. I mean, I, you know. The only thing I didn't buy about that movie is he plays an actor in a movie. So I'm sure his wife, who is Sally Field in the, in the in the movie, like I'm sure that she would hear him doing voices. Yeah, well, and him like <laughs> I think that she would recognize in, in truthful reality. Of course, beyond the yeah. the script, I think she would recognize his voice. Of course, don't you think so? Of course, is that like a loophole yeah. in the movie? Yeah, I'm probably reading into it a little too much. Every time I watch it, I think of that. Yeah, I, I never think to really myself, thought. I mean. Is he that it's good? Not, it's not you know? that surprising. Maybe he is that good. Yeah, it's Robin Williams, yeah. so maybe. Maybe he is. <laughs> and now, his own son didn't recognize yeah, him. Yeah, that's, so. that's true. So maybe he was that good. Uh, Chris Columbus, the director, was amazed how far Williams took his performance. Uh, first, he would play each scene, as scripted, two or three times, and then was allowed to improvise. Columbus allowed him to do a lot of improv because that is where the film's funniest material came from. Scenes were shot from 15 to 22 times because Williams wasn't satisfied until he had the scene worked out of his system. Columbus admitted he never knew where, where Williams was going to go and take the character next. During the restaurant scene in Mrs. Doubtfire, when he's uh, uh, sitting at the table, right, in the restaurant, and his false teeth yeah. fall into the <coughs> drink, yeah, the, uh, that was, was not planned, ones. right? No, it wasn't. It just fell it was, out of his mouth? Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, and apparently the crew was laughing so hard <laughs> because, you know. It was funny. They, I mean, it, that's great stuff. <laughs> then the same thing <laughs> happened when he had that, uh, what, cake uh, yeah. icing on his face. When right? he's dripping into that, uh, he's making, what, coffee, I think? I, uh, it, uh, tea. 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 Yes. And it's, it's dropping. And, like, it was because the lights are so hot in the studio oh, and stuff. Okay. It was melt. It was literally melting off his face. <laughs> and, and he was fun. improvising the whole thing. And once again, the crew's just, like, fucking hilarious. <laughs> and, you know, it ends up in the movie. That's great. I love stuff like that. I love hearing about stuff like yeah. that. Because you, you don't, you think it's scripted. You're just, you're watching it like an idiot. You're just like, well, this is probably how it's supposed to but go. But sometimes some of the it's best not. stuff is just like, man, it's... he was dicking around the whole time. Things like that happen with Robin Williams a lot, I'm oh, sure. Oh, yeah. Just those, those moments that happen uh, organically, that is the best stuff. And I think that's why he was so good, because of the improv. When you improv, that is the most real you're going to get on a film, in my opinion, yeah. because that is coming directly from you. It's really happening. It's really you. It's in really that, happening. You're really in that moment, In too. that moment. It's so important. Which, oh, I which love is, that stuff. You know, what they teach you in acting is to not be in your head. Right. And so many, dude, you watch so much bad acting. It's Ugh. just, you get accustomed to these people just saying their, they're just saying their lines. Ugh. And, and that's where it's, it's hard enough to say those lines, uh, truthfully. Right. Um, but it's even better when it's improvised because it's, it's really coming out of, of nowhere in yeah. a sense. And Robin Williams Kind of the king of that, yeah. In and, a sense. and you mentioned he like a soap opera acting is like the worst acting you can. Uh, yeah, well, that uh, that reminds me of Heath Ledger. Early in his career, he did a soap opera for about six months to a year in his early career, and he was so depressed that he thought that he just was gonna quit because his acting went. He was on an upswing at one point. He did the soap, 
and it started going down because yeah. he was around bad acting. Yeah. He was, and then he realized that he took it in a good way and thought to himself, okay, I learned what ba- bad acting is all about. So he just, <laughs> I, I, he's like, I have to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. <laughs> get out, dude. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, there you go. Um, so um, there are a few movies that I want to just mention before we get into, you know, Goodwill Hunting. Before we get into that, he did Being Human in 94 Nine Months in 95. That's a cute movie. Jumanji in 95. The Birdcage, which is one hell of a performance. Yeah. I don't want to get too much into that one because we're running out of time. Yeah. But Birdcage, he plays a homosexual, like a nightclub owner, right, with Nathan Lane. Mm Mm-hmm. And just tremendous acting by the both of them. Oh, Very yeah. convincing. Nathan Lane It's is great. funny. It's touching. Just a fun movie to watch. And, and here we go. 1997, Good Will Hunting. You want to start this off? Wow. I don't know. Oh, Wait, before we do, hold on one <laughs> second. Yeah. All right. Good Will Hunting. We had to take a little break there. We're back. <laughs> yeah. This is really weird, too, because when I do my normal podcast, we're actually not... In my normal setting, we're at my brother's house in his basement. He's got a really nice basement. We'll spread out. You know, it's finished. And uh, we're sitting here. And when I'm at home, I'm in a little walk-in closet, you know, sitting cross-legged on the floor because, you know, I got to have all the sound (laughs) turned off around me because I got kids and they're screaming, yelling, running around. And we're downstairs in his basement and we got a drink. We got, you know, we, we smoke. We have cigarettes here, you know, going from time to time. And my brother's got one right now, actually. You know what? I'm going to start one, too. Why not? Sure. But anyways, it's really nice to be sitting here just talking. Mm-hmm. And we just mentioned we were kind of nervous to do this. This is the first time he's doing it. So it's like, Ugh. And I'm yeah. like, I've never had anybody else on this podcast. And it's a good thing to do. We're just having fun doing it. So I wanted to mention that real quick before we get into Goodwill Hunting. And I want to start off with Goodwill Hunting, uh, talking about Matt Damon and Ben Affleck. I get Matt Damon... And Ben Affleck, both from Boston. Um, <clears throat> Matt Damon went to Harvard. Yeah. He was, he's a very smart kid, guy. And they wrote a script together. And we always kind of joke about the whole fact that Ben Affleck and Matt Damon yeah. wrote it together. But how much did Ben Affleck really have a part in it? Was it all Damon? But I don't know. Ben Affleck has sort of proven me that he's sort of, you know, he knows what the hell he's doing. Yeah. He's pretty damn good. Yeah. He he's surpri- has, has he surprised you, Ben Affleck? He's, yes. Yeah, yeah, and right. I mean, <clears throat> he's great in Goodwill Hunting, and I, well, yeah. I guess I never really understood that whole, you know, Ben Affleck hate, but oh, uh, okay. I, 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 I always liked him. I always thought okay. he was good. You know, Chasing Amy was a great movie. Yeah, you know, With he was Kevin always Smith, good in those Kevin Smith, Kevin Smith movies. Smith thing, yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, but yeah, they wrote they, the script together. Yeah, they right? had the script, and it was missing something. Yes, it was missing something. Okay, they brought it to studio. They had it all over the place. It's a good script, but they told them, "Listen, it needs something else. You're missing something. You need another character." So they had to think of a character, and this is what it was missing: Robin Williams's character. Could you imagine Goodwill Hunting without Robin Williams's character? Yeah. No, no it doesn't one, work without it. You wouldn't. And they were we right. wouldn't be talking about it no. at all. No one would be. And uh, I think Robin Williams, and he will end up winning Best Oscar, Best Actor for this supporting role. In a supporting role. In a supporting role. Oh, I'm sorry. That was a supporting <clears throat> role. Yeah. He won the Academy Award because of this movie. And his character plays a psychiatrist. Um, so the reason why, and Matt Damon will go on to say that when he thinks of his success right now, the first thing he thinks of is how it all really started with Robin Williams and what he learned from him in this movie, right? Yeah. And the reason why this movie was so successful. It really got them going. Oh, of course. So you get Robin Williams on board for that kind of role. Um, I mean, one of the most amazing roles. I, I know when I first saw this movie, I loved it from beginning to end. It was just... It was great, but the Robin Williams character yeah. is really what made it, <clears throat> it so did. good. The scene where he has him in his office and Matt Damon is going through some shit and he's finally connecting with him. And he pulls that it's not your fault because yeah. they're talking about the abuse that Matt yeah. Damon's character had when he was a kid. And that's why he was so shut off from his emotions. And he says to him, he says, it's not your fault. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, I know. It's not my fault. 
and he kept repeating it, repeating it, and repeating it. So good. Until he gets through to him. Right. That, you know, it really isn't your fault. And the two know? of them just bond. Um, the, the scene on the park bench mm. is probably that's one the of best. my favorite scenes of the movie. Maybe all time. In any Yeah, movie. that's pretty, yeah. That, I can't really argue Very, with that. It's, it's eye-opening mm-hmm. on a lot of levels just by what he says to him. Like, you think you know everything, but you don't. Yeah. You can't experience life by reading books. You have to go out there. You have to expose yourself to things that you're afraid of, mm-hmm. to grow, to learn. And he's like, you, you don't know a thing about war. That, you know, you, okay, you've read books about it, War and Peace, but right. you've never held a, a friend in your arms while he dies. Yeah. Or you, you don't know about love. You read a sonnet but you never really truly looked in another person's well, eyes. Was, it felt completely vulnerable. Was that monologue improvised, some of it? That, I don't know. That might have been in the script, but okay. knowing Robin Williams, you know, he has a set script in front of him, Yeah. but God only knows what he puts into it and adds, subtracts, uh, and, and that is a scene that is so touching, <clears throat> so good. I, yeah. It's on so many levels. Well, I do know that... Um, <laughs> the lines where he's starting to talk about his wife farting in her sleep and stuff, that was yeah. ad-libbed. And that was Matt ad-libbed. Damon is really laughing because this was not in the script. It was all bullshit at the time, and he's yeah. really losing it. Yeah, I just like the way they kind of – you could tell they went off script because he's like uh, – he, he just out of nowhere says, my my wife farts in her sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, you know. Because, it, she, yeah. She'd wake herself up and I'd have to blame the dog, you know. Yeah, she woke I mean, herself up. <laughs> It was so loud. Uh, yeah. It's those tidbits as, as well as, uh, you know, I learned, I didn't know this until I did research, but his, uh, Robin Williams' character, the psychiatrist's office is set up like a baseball diamond. Mm. And okay. you get the full effect when he's doing the whole Carlton Fisk. Because it's all um, set up like a baseball yeah, diamond? it's all set up like a baseball That's diamond. That's funny. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, was that his idea? I'm sure yeah, it was. Well, I don't know. Maybe. I, well, well, I always the director Gus Van Sant. Oh, Gus Van Sant. Yeah, I mean, it I, could have been his idea. I don't. I'm not and sure. It was really strange to see Gus Van Sant do a movie like this. I don't know why. He usually does like really big in- independent films. Uh, I don't think this is an independent it, film. It, well, do you think it is? Kind you of. You eliminate Robin Williams. Is uh, if Robin Williams wasn't. A uh, well-known actor. That's an independent movie for sure. Okay. I mean... I get that, but Miramax d- did this film, I think. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, so I could say... It, but it didn't feel like an independent movie to me. No, it came out in the theaters. Yeah. I was in New York at this time, in New York City. It was a when big it came movie. Out. It was a big it, movie it that came out. Movie. It had a lot of buzz. Independent movies don't come out with a lot of buzz. Independent movies get done, and if they're successful, then you hear about it. Yeah, that's So true. I was kind of surprised Gus Van Sant did this movie, and it was really good. His directing is fantastic. <clears throat> oh, yeah. He's good anyway. Yeah. He should do more, you know, high-budget films, I think. I, but I don't know what he's doing now. He's probably getting up there in age, Gus Van Sant. I don't know what recent things that he's done, no, if they've no been idea. successful. But a very good movie, of course. Goodwill Hunting is just one of those movies that you can sit down and watch over and over. Yeah, it's one of my faves. And you can get something new out of it, too. Every time I see it, I kind of see something else, or I get a different emotion uh, from it. And just a fascinating story. Uh, Matt Damon did and Ben Affleck did one hell of a job with this story of a, of a, of a kid who is a genius, mm-hmm. and, and Matt Damon's performance is phenomenal. Oh, yeah. Phenomenal. Oh, I mean, and they both walked away with best screenplay. And not to, everybody in that movie is really fan, fantastic. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Everyone's perfectly cast. And the acting, everybody's acting, even the small parts sure. work. Yeah, uh, I mean, Casey Affleck, I know he had a small oh, part. Oh, yeah. That's right. But Casey he was Affleck. good. Um, I can't remember the professor, the other professor's name. Yeah, his son is like a big star now. and uh, um, My wife is totally in love with this actor. He was in True Blood. I, I forget his name. But uh, uh, yeah, that's okay. his dad. Uh, they're like Swedish or something. I don't want to talk out of turn, but they're not American. Okay. They're like from Sweden or something like that. Uh, but yeah, he was good in it. Dr. Yeah. Lambo or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. something like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and just saying, overall, the, the movie to me is like perfect. 
You know, there's not a weak link. No, it, there's not. From beginning to end, you, it holds your attention. Yeah. I think that's probably the best way to describe it. So Goodwill Hunting gets two thumbs up from the Tarowski brothers here talking about Robin Williams. Now we're going to go ahead and round out his films. Uh, 2002 of notable films. One Hour Photo is a movie that I watched for the first time, actually, when I was not feeling well at night. This one night, I just, you know, I had this, I just couldn't sleep. I didn't feel well. So I went out to the living room, and this was on, I don't know, <clears throat> HBO or something. We might have had HBO at that time. What year is this? God, it's when... had, we were at uh, Kingsdale, so that was probably about okay. 10 years ago. Oh, no shit. And so what, this came on 2002, so that makes sense. And I was, I watched it twice. Like, oh, yeah. I did, yeah. I watched it twice because I must have had it on a loop or something. I just kept watching it. So four straight hours of one-hour photo. And it, do you, you've seen it, I'm I sure? Have, yeah. yeah. What you, that character. Yeah, creepy as Ooh, hell. Ooh, creepy I, shit. I like this movie. I don't think it did well at the box office. No, it didn't. Um, but I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was great. He was truly creepy yeah. in that film. Yeah, it was the side of Robin Williams. You're just like, who are you? You're not Hook. <laughs> right. <laughs> Peter Pan, I mean, you're not, you know? Like, right. That kind of role. Very creepy movie, but one of note. I mean, in the night at the museum, he played Teddy Roosevelt. Cute movie. Ben Stiller. Yeah, I like those. It, okay. Those are good movies. They're, They're funny good. as hell. And uh, he did a really good job playing Teddy. Uh, 2009, World's Greatest Dad. Uh, I have to admit, I haven't seen it. And I did. Okay, what would you think of um, it? It's, like, it's low-budget independent mm-hmm. film. It's not bad. Um, what's I'll really, have to watch it. What's really creepy about it is uh, the very beginning, his son accidentally kills himself. Okay. Uh, pretty much the same way Robin Williams killed himself. Ugh. Using a belt Ugh. and the closet door. Okay. Um, but, you know, his son was kind of a dick. Okay. And Robin Williams tried to cover it up as a suicide. Mm-hmm. It's a very dark movie, but he's, he's very good. It's not bad. Okay, well, I, I'll have to check it out. I, I, I see it on Netflix a yeah, lot, yeah, that, and I was just like, that's eh, how I it, it looks just kind of corny, and yeah, uh, I just get a bad vibe just by looking at the, yeah, you know, the screening of it. I get it. And, uh, <laughs> so maybe I'll give it. it a shot. Um, and then in 2014, The Angriest Man in Brooklyn, uh, and I have a little note here that my brother wrote down. He said, I couldn't watch, and it's in bold. Turned it off after 30 minutes, and that happens sometimes, yeah, right? Yeah, I couldn't get into yes. it, man. <laughs> It was that good, huh? it, it, it seemed it was just bad writing. Uh, looked like he was just kind of walking through it. Mm. It's like the only time I saw a performance of his that I didn't enjoy. Well, this was, this was not that long ago, and we're going to get into the later stages of his life leading up to his suicide. And uh, this might relate to that, is that later on in his career in life, he was doing movies he didn't want to do. He really did. Uh, he was going, paying a lot of divorces off. He was uh, married twice, and both of them uh, had him, I don't want to say he was living paycheck to paycheck, but it took a big hit in his finances. So he was doing movies he did not want to do. And I'm sure that this is one of them. could have been one of them. Okay, so let's go ahead and touch upon his family. Real quick, though, we skipped over Patch Adams. We did. Which I... I'm love, sorry. Love yeah. Patch Adams. Oh my God. I don't know. Well, yeah, huh, I really it, it did. It just happens. That. <laughs> you know, that's, we spend so much time on Goodwill. I yeah, mean, we did. Okay. Well, let's, let's touch a little bit on Patch. Yeah. Well, briefly, cause I know we're, this is long. No, that's okay. But, um, I love Patch Adams. I mean, it's based on a true story about a doctor who really tried to treat patients as people, mm-hmm. as a real person. And, um, the real Patch Adams didn't like this movie. Really? Yeah. Okay. Um, Why did he say? I don't think it was an accurate portrayal. Okay. I mean, you get Hollywood well, involved, that happens and it's not going to be. That it's not all the know? time. But I mean, for what it's worth, I mean, it still gets the message out. Yeah. I mean, this was a big movie. A lot of people loved it. Um, but there's so many great scenes in this movie. I was introduced to Philip Seymour Hoffman in this movie. That's right. You That's know. notable. Very notable, <laughs> yeah. Because he's fucking awesome. Yeah, I remember uh, watching that mm-hmm. and thinking, like, who the fuck is this guy? Because he's a, he's amazing. <clears throat> Philip Seymour Hoffman never gave a bad performance. No, I don't think he did. Nope. All the movies I've seen of him, 
One hundred percent. He's Every good time. in everything he did. He he really is amazing. Another one I can't wait to talk about. Yeah. Maybe we could do yeah. a, a Hoffman together. That um, would be fine with me because yeah. another one that died. No, I mean there it seems like they're he, just dropping like flies. Yeah. It, that was very sad. Oh my god! It, it, some of the greatest ones have just died recently, or and just some of them mysteriously and just tragic. You yeah. know. Uh, so hard to hear, and when you hear it, you're just like, son of a bitch. And we'll get into that a little later about um, his death because it, it really goes to show you how someone can impact the lives of so many others. And I think Robin Williams is that person when he died. Yeah. Boy, it was just like a, what? <clears throat> it, people were just blown away by the fact that he was gone. It's like, Robin Williams is gone? No, he's not. Don't say that to me, right? You're kidding. Well, let's touch upon that. Because I think you mentioned that, too, Like, because I sent a text out. Yeah. And you didn't when, know about it? When, um, <laughs> the day he died, I went to a doctor to talk about my own depression. Depression, yeah. And anxiety and stress and anger problems. The that same I was same thing that Robin was going through. Yeah, I mean his to not, maybe a not, higher no, level. No, yeah, not yeah. the same. Right, not but, but around the same. I was uh, twenty fourteen was a really bad year for me, mm. and uh, I made that step to be like, okay, let's try to figure this out, get some help. Sure. And I I went to the doctor that day. Really? And Jesus. you know, talked to this doctor that I didn't even know, just recommended from. Uh, I think my cousin, our cousin Bob, mm. and uh, you know, he filled out a prescription for me. He picked it up at Walgreens, and then he came home, and so I was working on a painting of Snoopy, mm. and <laughs> you know, and I was like feeling good. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to going work. on the right. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm trying to go on the right path. And you send a group in the group chat with us. You're like. And, and I wrote this down because I wanted to make sure it was word for word of what you sent. It was like, <clears throat> um, Robin Williams is gone. <laughs> the question mark, question mark, question mark. Yeah, and you're like, sad, 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 sad day. Yep, and it was. I and, couldn't believe it. And I didn't believe it either, and I, I Googled it. <laughs> you had to make sure. I immediately Googled it, and it was, you know. Then it hit you. Suicide, yeah. 63 years old. And... um. And I felt weird thinking this at the time, but when I was doing my research, I was reading, like, just from unknown people, just regular people, I felt the same way they did. I felt like I lost someone I knew. Yeah. I felt like I lost, like, an uncle or something. It's something because, like that. And I felt that it was kind of weird because I never met him. I don't know the guy. But it was, like, you, it was because of the performances. It's because of, like, he really brought himself to the table. Really him. Yeah. And that's where you really do know him, in a sense. You feel like you do. And I think a lot, you know, even these celebrities are like, he really was like that. And yeah. that's him. Yeah. That's Robin Williams. Yeah. And you're just like, so to feel that, I don't feel as dumb as I did at the time, because yeah. a lot of people did. You felt that something about him, even though, like you said, we don't, we don't know him. We didn't know him. But he was that type of guy that, when he did pass, you started to hear all the people that loved him, all the people that knew him go, and they were not full of shit, saying that he was the best person they ever knew. He was a giving person. He gave a lot to his friends, his family, uh, people he didn't know. He was very giving, and he was able to help out anybody that needed his help. They were willing to accept what he had to offer. It was friendship and love. And he really did reach a lot of people in that way. So when he died a piece of other people died as well. I really do believe that. Uh, and that is monumental. And that's why we felt it too. A lot of people did. And just knowing that he's not with us anymore is so sad. Um, and before we go any further, let's go ahead and talk about his family before we start to talk about his death. Williams married his first wife, Valerie Velarde, in June of 1978, following a live-in relationship with comedian Elaine Boozler. Velarde and Williams met in 1976 while he was working as a bartender at a tavern in San Francisco. Their son, Zach, was born in 1983, and Williams and Velarde ended up divorcing in 88. On April 30th, 1989, he married Marcia, and I don't know about this last name, Garces, 
And uh, that was Zachary's nanny, I guess. So he married the nanny. Very interesting. And then uh, with this nanny, they had two children, Zelda, who looks a lot like her dad, by the way. Have you ever seen a picture yeah. of Zelda? It's really mm-hmm. kind of she does. scary freaky. But she looks a lot like her dad. And there's also Cody that was born in 1991. In March of 2008, this wife, Garces, filed for divorce from Williams, citing Eric, irre- what do they call that? Irreconcile. Irrecus- I can't say that word. It's like a moron. <laughs> they had differences, okay? They didn't get along. They didn't get along. <laughs> Uh, their divorce was finalized in 2010. Williams married his third wife, graphic designer Susan Schneider, on October 22, 2011, in California. The two lived at their house in Seacliff, San Francisco. Williams stated, and this is his quote, My children give me a great sense of wonder just to see them develop into these extraordinary human beings. End of quote. So... Leading up to Robin's death, um, he was he was ill and wasn't sure exactly what was wrong with him. Okay, so he was feeling off. And... Yeah, and he was misdiagnosed at the time. He thought he had Parkinson's. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a lot of symptoms that were similar to Parkinson's. Okay. But uh, it seems that, doing my research, it seemed like even leading up to his death... He knew something was off. He he didn't right. think he had Parkinson's. He thought it was something else. Even okay. his his wife at the time, um, she's like they they had an answer, but she she knew that Robin wasn't really buying it. Okay, and um, he was showing unrelated symptoms to Parkinson's, like uh, constipation, urinary difficulty. Sleepless, sleeplessness and insomnia, um, a poor sense of smell, okay. even. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so it wouldn't be until later that they diagnosed him with Louis body. Um, is it a disease? <clears throat> it is. Okay. And it's, it's very rare. Um, Fatal? They, or can you live with it for a while? I don't know. Mm. Um, it's very rare. It's hard to really... Um, diagnose somebody with it, I guess. Okay. But um, <clears throat> anyways, he he was basically going through a tremendous amount of depression during this time. Okay. You know, um, and, and this is going to be tough to, to talk about because doing the research, you know, you, you, you lead up to his final days and yeah. it's sad. I'm going to basically quote what his wife wrote about. Okay. <clears throat> Um, he had, he had spent the weekend with his wife. They, um, she says here and and I'll quote, we did all the things we love on Saturday day and into the evening. It was perfect. Like one long date. By the end of Sunday, I was feeling that he was getting better. We retired for sleep in our customary way. My husband said to me, good night, my love. And waited for my familiar reply, "Good night, my love." Oh man! So this is the last that she had seen of Robin Williams. And you know, you bring up this so-called disease, whatever. And and in the process of finding out what he had, he was depressed. He was not feeling well. Uh, his career wasn't going like it used to. He was getting older. And I also believe because of this disease that he had, he was on a lot of medication. This disease required a lot of medication, and this medication had side effects of depression. So it yes. was just, yeah, a lot going on. Uh, so that night, maybe the effects of the medication really just messed him up. It took its toll. It Apparently took, it did. Apparently um, it, it just reached he, a point. He, he went off into his bedroom. They, they slept in different rooms at this time because he was experiencing yeah. this insomnia. Wasn't he like on a couch or something like uh, that? No, he had his own, he was in his own room. Okay. Um, he even had its own bathroom. I mean, like he was okay. in his own separate corridors okay. and, uh, he, uh, things got, his assistant became suspicious when she was knocking at the door around 11 45 AM that Monday and mm. there was no answer. Right. 
So she actually opened the door with a paper clip. Wow. And, and that's where she found Robin Williams. He was uh, wearing a black T-shirt, black, uh, black jeans, and he was... <sighs> Wasn't he up against a door or something? He was in a seated position with a belt around his neck that was clasped to the the closet door. Okay. And, you know, immediately called for help. And um, he apparently, when they did the autopsy and, you know, the police investigated, he tried to cut his wrists. Oh, that's right. I read about that. And... <clears throat> even found that they, he cleaned up the blood that really? he left in the bathroom. Oh, man. It's the, it's the, he was completely aware of what he was doing. He, he wanted to kill himself, it's so obviously. Up. And, oh, my God. And, it was, and it's all stemmed from, you know, when you first hear it, you think it's because he was depressed, but this was different it was circumstances. More than, it was more than that. It was this Louis Body's disease that he had. It's Louis Body dementia. Okay. That his mind was that really stemmed from his state of mind. He, he they say you start hallucinating. He, he was he in was bad shape. Shit. Oh boy, he was in very bad shape. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna wrap it up here with a quote, and it's a quote from President Barack Obama in 2014 when he di- when he died. Now here's the quote: Robin Williams was an airman, a doctor, a genie, a nanny, a president a professor, a bing-ring, Peter Pan, and everything in between. But he was one of a kind. He arrived in our lives as an alien, but he ended up touching every element of the human spirit. I love that. That's good. He made us laugh. He made us cry. He made his immeasurable talent freely and generously to those who needed it most, from our troops stationed abroad to the marginalized on our own streets. The Obama family offers our condolences to Robin's family, his friends, and everyone who found their voice and their verse. Thanks to Robin Williams, end of quote. And that's a great quote. Yeah. From the president, right? It's not often a president will make a statement about a celebrity passing away. Goes to show you. Just how, and we left out a lot of quotes here. Like he was friends with Chevy Chase. He gave a nice quote. De Niro, Ben Affleck, Bill Maher, Andy Garcia, Jeff Bridges. I mean, it goes on and on, people. He touched many lives. Robin Williams will go down. Is one of the most talented human beings to ever walk this planet. And that's saying something. It's important. And doing this episode today, well, tonight, with my brother here was special. And it was really fun. Uh, I enjoyed it. We were really nervous to do it. But it ended up being really fun to do. Absolutely. And, you know, this is episode number 27 <clears throat> of the Actors Room. So thank you so much for uh, just listening to us go back and forth talking about acting and Robin Williams and things like that. And we enjoy doing it. Uh, so I'm sure we will collaborate once again to do something together. For sure. Uh, maybe once a month. You know, whenever something grabs you, you want to be like, hey, Jeff, let's do, uh, we just talked about Philip Seymour Hoffman. Maybe we'll do uh, Hoffman or something together uh, or any other actor or actress that you want to do. Yeah. Uh, Just say, hey, Jeff, uh, I'm going to do some research on this guy and uh, let's set up, do something in a few weeks. So in the future, uh, look out for more episodes featuring Dave Tarowski. Uh. (laughs) All right. Rock on. (laughs) So uh, my name's Jeff Tarowski. And I am going to go ahead and remind you to please go on to iTunes, people. Please, I know there's people listening. You're out there. I've seen the numbers. It's not a lot, but there are people listening. You have to go on iTunes, leave a review. It takes five seconds to type in, doing a good job, or you're not doing a good job. I don't even care. Do, do negative comments if you want to. Get it out there. Uh, I need responses. Visit the website, theactorsroom.lipson.com. I'm also on iTunes. iTunes. Uh, I'm on uh, YouTube now. I have a YouTube channel that you can look up my shows there. If you don't want to go to the website or go on iTunes, YouTube's huge now, so go on YouTube. I also have a Twitter account. Check that out and a Facebook page. So I'm going to leave you with this. This is my saying now. Go ahead tonight. Put in a movie, one that you love, one that makes you laugh. Hey, 
Put in a Robin Williams movie tonight, right? Awakenings. But put in Awakenings. Go rent it if you can rent it. You go on your uh, your uh, provider. Go rent it on the provider. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. Put in a Robin Williams movie. I mean, you can't get much better than that. Am I right? No, you're absolutely right. I'm absolutely right. So sit back, relax, have a drink <clears throat> or two or three or four. Or eight, like I or, did. Or eight. If that's, if that's what it takes to get yourself <laughs> getting on a nice buzz, end your week, right? It's Friday night for us, so we're going to go ahead and wrap this up and uh, maybe do a little editing. Uh, so thank you so much for listening. God bless you. Have a good one. Good morning, Vietnam! Yeah! I do a great impression of a hot dog. <laughs> Mr. Hillard, do you consider yourself humorous? I used to. There was a time when I found myself funny. But today, you have proven me wrong. Thank you. Look at me, son. It's not your fault. I know. It's not your fault. I know. No, no, you don't. It's not your fault. I know. It's not your fault. All right? It's not your fault. Carpe diem. Seize the day. I don't know how much value I have in this universe, but I do know that I made a few people happier than they would have been without me, and as long as I know that, I'm as rich as I ever need to be. So I'll catch you on the rebound, your magnitude. Until next week. Nanu! Nanu! I'm not coming up to your apartment. That was never my intention. Oh, God, you don't want to. Oh, no, I want to. I have a hard on for you the size of Florida. A doctor's mission should be not just to prevent death, but also to improve the quality of life. That's why you treat a disease, you win, you lose. You treat a person, I guarantee you, you win. Life is fleeting. And if you're ever distressed, cast your eyes to the summer sky. When the stars are strung across the velvety night. And when a shooting star streaks through the blackness, turning night into day. Make a wish. Think of me. Make your life spectacular. I know I did. <laughs>